Well, good morning, everyone. So this week we are about at the close of the uh, introduction to the uh, Science of Mind textbook by Ernest Holmes. We are finishing up some things we didn't cover last week in Chapter 3 and moving into Chapter 4, which is all about how to use it, how to use it. So what I wanted to finish up from, from last week, from Chapter 3, <clears throat> is a very important point. And it's about love and law, love and law. And what Dr. Holmes is telling us is, is that when, when we as human beings, when we kind of contemplate the, the things that he's talking about in the creative process, and when, when we kind of contemplate uh, different worlds, religions, views of, of the Creator, we kind of uh, swing back and forth between two, two poles, if you want to consider it that way. The pendulum swings one way and then the other. But on the one, the one side, it is just spontaneity. It is, it is love. It is this idea that rules don't necessarily apply because, because God loves us. That kind of, no matter what happens, God's going to change the rules for us. If we, if we beg, if we beseech, if we plead hard enough, uh, that somehow somehow the situation will will change because the divine responds to us and changes changes the rules as they go along you know so we, we fall off a cliff and expect gravity to stop working for example the other side of the equation is is law that everything is just ruled by law and law has no spontaneity to it it has no, in, no decision-making process to it. So in the example of falling off the cliff, gravity works. You step off the cliff, you, you get sucked down to the ground by gravity. That's the way gravity works. So what Dr. Holmes is kind of bringing us to is, is we have to understand the balance of love and law. Love is the spontaneous discovery of something, the spontaneous desire to do something. We... We want to know something. We want to express something. We want to explore something. And this is a spontaneous expression of love, of love. You know, what, what would you do today? I love the, the, opening, um, the opening song to the uh, children's cartoon of uh, Pippi Longstocking. Longstocking, what shall we do today? What shall we do? What, what would you do today if you could do anything you wanted? You see, that's love. Excuse me, that's spontaneity, that's desire, that's will, that's volition. But then we have to know that once we desire to do something, there, there are laws, there are rules, there are, there are things that are consistent, that always unfold. And it's not just law. It's not just a mechanical clockwork universe. But it is a combination of love and law. So love is the reason, and law is the way. Law is the unfoldment. The divine said, let there be, in the book of Genesis. And then there was. So the, so the let there be is a, is a spontaneous declaration of something to be experienced. And then the law working as a blind force in that it cannot change its direction. It can organize the details of how that unfolds, but it cannot change the direction. The law makes it so. Again, we'll go back to the, to the example of the garden and the gardener and the soil and the seed. You know, so, so maybe, maybe we know that our beloved loves fresh vegetables. Our beloved loves fresh corn and fresh tomatoes and, and, and green beans. And we know this and we have a desire to, to do something, right? To move our feet, to do something. We want to do something, but it is an expression of our love. We want to grow the vegetables in the garden. So when our beloved comes home to visit or comes home for supper, or whatever the circumstances might be, we can present them with something that we 
believe will bring them pleasure, right? will allow them to enjoy, will allow them to experience, will allow them to express. So with love in our hearts, we go, we go to the seed store and we carefully pick out all the different seeds that we're going to plant in our garden. And, and then we come home and we get, our, we get our garden tools out and we till the soil and we remove all of the, all of the debris, the sticks and the stones and, and the leaves and, er, and everything else that's there. And we prepare the soil properly. And we, with love in our hearts, we are doing what needs to be done to cooperate with the way that nature works. But we have love in our heart. Our impulse is love. Our desire is love. Our desire is, is true happiness for our beloved. So we go and we plant our seeds in the garden. And we read the, <laughs> read the packet, you know. If you're like me, you have to read the packet for instructions. And it tells you how, how deep and how far apart to, uh, to plant each particular seed. You know, and maybe you even you even read, well, if you take if you take pole beans and you plant some pole beans around the corn stalk, when the corn stalk comes up, the pole beans will wrap themselves around the corn stalk, and you can have corn and beans at the same time. You know, and you study and you find out that if you plant a certain certain plant next to the tomato plants, it'll keep the bugs off the tomatoes, and and you go about this with love in your heart with a sense of, of cooperation. But once you do this, you see, once you put your seeds in the ground and you cover them over and you sprinkle them with water, see, then the law takes over. The law of nature takes over. We don't go out every 15 minutes and take the dirt off the seeds to see if anything's happening. We trust. We have faith. We have turned it over to the law of the soil, if you want to consider that to be a law. The, the chemical laws, the laws of thermodynamics, the, sun, the sunlight heats the soil to a particular temperature and something within that seed, whatever type seed it is, knows that at that time it is appropriate for that seed to sprout. And the seed and the soil and the sunlight and the rain, you know, they're, they're all kind of neutral forces None of them say, well, wait a second, you know, you, you planted tomatoes here and um, I, I, don't think, I don't think tomatoes are really what your beloved wants. So I am going to make a substitution here. I'm going to put cucumbers in instead. The law acts as a blind force. It knows what to do and it knows how to do it with great intelligence, <laughs> you know. If, if you gave me a packet of seeds and said, Jim, I want you to figure out, I want you to figure out how that thing sprouts, I couldn't tell you, you know. Now, some, some very smart person probably can understand the conditions under which it sprouts. You know, well, if the temperature is a certain temperature and the moisture is a certain moisture, it'll sprout. But that's only describing how it works, you know, not why it works. But there's something in that seed, there's something in the law that knows, that knows what to do, and it does it. So what Dr. Holmes is telling us to do is, do not make the mistake of thinking, I don't really have to, uh, I don't really have to decide what I want because, because God already knows what I want and God's going to give it to me. Remember, we're told in the New Testament, it says, it says, the Father in heaven knows what you want before you ask, but you must ask believing. Right? So there's something that we have to do. There's something that we have to do to cooperate. That's the love part. We have to cooperate. But once we cooperate, once we, we plant our seed into the fertile soil of of the mind, of the mind of the universe, of the subconscious mind. Once we do that, we must trust and be assured that just as the seed and the soil and the sunlight and the rain conspire, conspire for the good of that seed to sprout and to grow and to thrive, that there is an intelligent law at work that has taken the seed of our 
declaration, if you want to call it that, our, our statement of this is what I shall have, and brings it about. So we have to recognize that, that there's two pieces to it. There's love and there's law. There's love and there's law. I must decide. And what is the, what is the value that I use when I decide things? I must decide, is this for the highest good of all? Is this thing, is this thing that I would bring <clears throat> into my experience for the highest good of all? Does it give a greater expression of love in this, in this lifetime? Does it give a greater expression to truth or to beauty or to happiness? You know, Emerson tells us uh, in, in one of his essays, he said, if we would utter a prayer for ourselves that we would not utter for all humanity, it's a bad prayer. It's a bad prayer. It's not about being selfish, see. It's about being love. It's about being love. So I am inviting you to consider then that every day when you wake up, every day and every moment that you can remember it of every day is ask yourself, how am I, how am I being a better instrument of God's love today? And when we can decide that, well, I express God's love today by planting this garden. I express God's love today by, by cooking this meal. You know, I express God's love today by writing this essay or giving this talk or all of the different things that we do, you know, by serving my customers, by caring for my children and grandchildren, by being loved to my significant other. However we choose to do that, that's, that's our responsibility. Divine love is not going to make that decision for us. We are required to decide. But once we decide, we have to recognize that there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief. And we have to trust it and we have to use it. See? And I think what happens to us is, is, is we go through life and we learn how life works according to the human expectation of how life works and how to do things and all that. And we forget that we have this unlimited intelligence willing to work with us. We have this unlimited power willing to work with us. And all we have to do is, is ask believing in our hearts and it will cooperate with us. And if we, if we choose to ignore it, it will it will act like it's not there. If we, if we choose to believe it's not working, it'll work by not working, it's, which sounds like a catch-22. So what he's trying to inspire us to when we get to, when we get to this, this uh, point where we are today, the fourth chapter, is use it. Use it. How to use it. This is the, the title of the chapter. And I want to to um, I want to start with just just reading the first paragraph of this chapter one of the great difficulties of the new order of thought is that we are likely to indulge in too much theory and too little practice as a matter of fact we only know as much as we can prove by actual demonstration that which we cannot prove may or may not be true <laughs> But that which we can prove certainly must be and is the truth. Now he goes on to say that, that, that this is true in any, in any science, you know. Scientists discover in, invisible, uh, invisible things, invisible energies, you know. But then they have to go on to prove that their theory about how that energy works is, is appropriate, right? So... For example, if I told you that there's this invisible power in the universe and this invisible power will take anything that you release into it and bring it to the floor, you might say, well, yeah, what is that? And I would say, well, it's gravity. And you would say, well, of course, you know, of course, yeah, sure, gravity. Gravity, will, anything you let go of will go right to the floor. That's how gravity works. But why do you believe that? Why do you know that? Well, that's your experience, right? It's been that way since you came, you came into the world. When you learned how to walk, you found out about gravity very quickly, you know. 
watch the little ones try to walk and it, they plop right down. But they get back up again, they get back up again, and they walk again, you know. Ever since we have been on this planet, we, we see gravity in action. Yet we don't know what gravity is, and we can't see gravity itself. We just see the, the reaction to gravity. Now, if, if gravity worked, sometimes it, sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't work, you know, uh, we might be less likely to believe that gravity was there. And this is why Dr. Holmes says that when we are working with what seems to be an intangible such as a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief, or the power through which prayer is answered. It requires, it requires our demonstration. It's not just enough to talk about it and feel good about it, although that's okay, feeling good is okay. But we have to put it to work, and we have to learn how to work with it. We have to learn how to use it, or, or we will never be sure that it's there. We will never be sure that it's there. And here's, here's the important part for our spiritual growth. Once we start to understand, and understand through observation and through experimentation and, and through demonstration, demonstrating that there is a law that responds to us according to our belief, once we start to see that, there can be no doubt that we are in a spiritual universe. We are in a spiritual system and that consciousness, that thought, thought which is a movement within consciousness, is, is a causative energy. So, so <laughs> we do that and we see the result and, and now we're very clear. We are more than the sum total of the cells in our body. We are conscious beings in a spiritual universe. And this is what Dr. Holmes is trying to tell us is the only way you will know that is by using it. The only way you will know that is by using it. And then we come into the issue of, well, sometimes it doesn't seem to work or sometimes people get sick and, and, and they don't get well. And, and why is that so? You know, if, if it were gravity, whatever we let go of goes to the floor. But in doing our mental practice and doing our spiritual work, sometimes <clears throat> sometimes it seems to work and sometimes it doesn't. And this is where people kind of swing back over to the, uh, to the love side of the, of the pendulum. Well, it didn't work because God has another reason or it didn't work because God has another purpose or, or, or all of those things. And what Dr. Holmes is asking us to consider is that if it seems not to work, it's just because we didn't provide the right channel for it to work through. Just, just go back to my experiments when I was learning how to work with electricity. You know, electricity works, and there's a way in which it works, and anyone who can cooperate with the way it works can get the result. So I would take my little breadboard experiment kit and I would read the instructions and I would put wires from one point to another point and solder in resistors and capacitors and do all of the things that I thought I was following the instructions. And then I would turn on my circuit and it didn't work. Well, it wasn't because electricity wasn't broken. You know, The law of electricity is the law of electricity. It was because I had not cooperated with it properly. So what he's asking us to consider then is we just didn't, we just didn't for some reason, we just didn't provide the right channel through which all of this could work. And to learn how to get better and better and better at providing the channel. That's the purpose of, of spiritual mind treatment, is to provide the avenue in consciousness, the avenue in consciousness through which the demonstration can be made. So in this manner, then, our life becomes our practice, our spiritual practice. And I, I think this is a, an important point to consider is if we say, is there a purpose of life itself? Why are we here? Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? And, and I think the why am I here, one of, the, one of the most consistent answers that we can find is that we are here to discover 
more about what God is and how God works, what the divine is and how the divine works, what love is and how love works. You know. We are constantly moving from this, uh, the state that we were born into, which, which as I mentioned a few weeks ago, is kind of a state of ignorance. Right? We're not fully awakened, we're not fully aware, otherwise we would be little machines. We would be automatons that you just push our button and we would all do exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. We have given up some of that knowledge of, of being at one in the presence of the divine, as is represented by the, the story of the Garden of Eden and the story of the, of the vessels in the Kabbalah. We have kind of entered into this space-time experience. We have let some of the, of the conscious awareness go. But part of us still remembers, part of us still knows. And what we are doing in this life is, is we are finding our way back home and we are doing it in a unique way. But each of us is, is doing it in an individualized, unique way. That's what we're doing. So if we say, well, gee, the purpose of this life then is, is to kind of bring ourselves closer in, the, in conscious realization to bring ourselves closer to the experience of God, then what practice or practices shall I use to do that, you know? So now we can go through life completely ignoring anything about the spiritual, and, and many of us have, have done that, you know, at times in our lives. Or we can find a set of practices that help us deliberately and consciously help us to do that. Now, sometimes we think that um, we have to go off to a cave somewhere and sit in a cave by ourselves and stare at the wall for, for eight or nine years to be completely without distraction from uh, the, the world as we know it. How, how are we going to find the divine when, when we have all of this stuff going on? You know, you turn on the news channel and it's just, oh my goodness, what else do I have to worry about today, you know? But we, we don't have to. We, we can. Now, for those, for those whose spiritual practice is to go into a hermitage and go far away and just sit and live, removed from the distractions of the world and spend a life in, in prayer and meditation, that, you know, that's their experience. And it's a good experience for them if that's their experience. But there's a way to be in the world and not of the world. To, to be able to go into our everyday living and to remind ourselves every day that we are surrounded by the love of God, that we are surrounded by the intelligence of God, that we are surrounded by the power of God. And this is where spiritual mind treatment as a practice comes in. It is very practical. It is something that we can do every day, each and every day, each and every day that you and I wake up, we have, as Wendy said in the opening quote, we have boundless opportunities before us. Which ones are we going to pursue? What do you want to do today? What shall we do today? How shall we be loved today? How shall we express this beautiful gift of life that we have been given today? And also, because we are living in the world, we at times have problems to solve or challenges to face if you want if you want to put it that way you know there's things that we've got to figure out there's things that we have to do and what we want to remember what we want to remember as as what did he call us he called us explorers explorers in a in a spiritual universe i think adventurers Adventurers and explorers. Are you an adventurer and an explorer? Can you step into this day and say, you know, no matter what this day presents, there is available to me the unlimited wisdom, the unlimited intelligence, the unlimited power that knows exactly how to do what needs to be done as the soil and the seed somehow know exactly what needs to be done. 
and they know exactly how to do it without us trying to tell it. You know, <laughs> you imagine middle managers on a, on a potato farm out there digging them up every week to see how they're doing and telling them what they need to do. Leave the potatoes alone. You know, let them grow. So what is it we would do today if we knew, if we really knew that we had the full support of the universe? You know? We look out at, at what's going on in our world today and so much of it is based on fear. People seem to be afraid of everything and, and it's come to a point where that fear has been raised to anger and that anger in some cases has raised to hatred and the hatred has spilled over into violence. What would life be like if there was no fear? You see? And what does the divine have to be afraid of? Nothing. Can we unite with that part of us that has nothing to be afraid of. Can we go into this day realizing that whatever the problem seems to be, the answer already exists and we just have to make ourselves available to it? Can we go into the day saying that whatever opportunity we want to pursue, the information, the resources, the helpmates, the, the, the ideas, everything that we need are already available. But we have to tune into them. We have to accept them, you see. <coughs> so I think most of our lives, we, we haven't considered that. We haven't considered um, asking for that help, if you want to consider it asking for help. Or we haven't considered, if you, if you want to be, be uh, more forceful in, in your thinking, we haven't considered compelling the law to do our bidding, you know. We don't even think about that. We, we think about it going about our lives as ordinary human beings. And we are not ordinary human beings. That's the thing that, that this helps us to realize. That every day that we sit down and we begin our day in a spiritual manner, deciding what it is that we will do today, declaring that all of the wisdom and all of the resources are available to help us, and then going about our day catching, catching the law in action, catching these things unfolding. See, then we start to grow and say, wait a second, I am not an ordinary human being. I am a spiritual being, a spiritual being right now. <clears throat> I am as spiritual a being now as I ever shall be. And I am in the process of awakening to that fact more and more and more every day. And my spiritual practice helps me to do that. My spiritual practice helps me. Tesla was one of the greatest inventors that our century or last century now has, has known. You know, so many things that he envisioned have come to us and, and have made the world a different place. You know, radio communications, microwave, microwave cooking, cell phone technology, all of these things are based on ideas that passed through him. And yet Tesla, uh, electricity in our home, for example, we use alternating current, which is, is the, the method that Tesla saw would be the, uh, the best way to, to transmit power from the generating plants to the homes. But Tesla, Tesla felt that his inventions were more of a revelation, that he would sit and he would see things unfold <clears throat> to his field of awareness. He would see these things unfold as if they were kind of, and I'm kind of interpreting here, but as if they already existed and he was just being shown what, what already was. And then he would try to figure out through, through what he knew, how am I going to make this? How are we going to bring this to the table, you see? But it was a revelation of sorts. And Dr. Holmes tells us that all of the great inventions of, of humanity, the great arts, the great, the great poetry, the great painting, the great inventions, the great governments, all of these things come to us through people 
who have made themselves available to, to be in touch with the presence of the divine, to allow themselves to be a conduit or a channel, a channel for God's good to enter this world. So what, I, what he, Dr. Holmes is encouraging us to do in this chapter is not, not just think, <clears throat> talk about it, you know, but to learn how to do it. And I've used this example before, you know, uh, when we learn a new skill, we can read lots and lots of books about how to do something, you know. We, now you can go on to uh, the internet and you can watch tons and tons of videos about how to do something. <laughs> and some of those videos might actually be accurate. A lot of them are not. But it's wonderful, you know, if I have a problem with the car and I say, gee, you know, I wonder, I wonder if anybody else has had this problem. I just type it in and sure enough, some kind soul somewhere has put a video up and says, if, if your car is doing this, check that, you know. So I watch about five of them, and if I find three that are agree, I, I go with whatever, that, whatever they say. But we can, we can know lots about things. We can find out lots of information about things. But until we actually do the thing, we don't really know. We don't really know. So in driver's ed, they taught us all about <laughs> useless information uh, to keep us in school, I think. They taught us all about how our car worked, which we didn't need to know to drive a car. But the basic, the basic thing you need to know to drive a car is, you know, one pedal makes it go and another pedal makes it stop. And there's a lever that makes it go <coughs> forward or backwards. And there's a wheel that makes it go from side to side. That's pretty much it, you know. So you can, you can read all you want to about turning the steering wheel and the way that people calculate whether they've turned the steering wheel far enough and how much gas to give, how hard to press on the pedal, <coughs> how hard to press on the brakes. You can read tons of books about that, but until you get behind the wheel for the first time and step on that gas pedal, feel the car jump out from under you, you know, or step on the brake and feel, feel everybody in the car go forward, you know. You have to do it in order to get the feedback that tells you whether or not you're doing it the way that you want to do it. You know, <coughs> Some people want to start off real fast from traffic light. Some people want to come to a screeching halt. Other people don't. You know, Other people want to drive like they've got that bowl of goldfish on the seat, like the insurance companies tell you. So we can, we can read and we can study what other people have told us about being spiritual beings living here now. And it may give us inspiration. It may give us, uh, Dr. Holmes said, a salutary feeling. We may feel good about it. But we have to use it. We have to use it. We have to apply it deliberately, as deliberately as if we were planting corn and tomatoes. Deliberately. We have to comply with the way the law works. We have to prepare the soil. We have to prepare our consciousness. We have to do our, our treatment practice. And then we have to expect the results. We have to expect the results. And if we didn't entirely get the results that we want, we, you know, we may try a different technique. We may alter the way that we're doing things until we find something that works. Th this is Again, this is something very important that I think um, I, I think we have to really emphasize. You know, sometimes people say, "Well, how often do I do I do my treatment?" And Dr. Holmes said, "Every day, every day until you get the result. You do not stop until you get the result." And I think, in many times, people will start. They'll say, "Well, this is what I shall have." They'll they'll work through the steps of treatment, they'll do the treatment for a day or a week or two, and then stop. And what we want to consider is, is that we are changing consciousness. We are removing the barriers in consciousness that are keeping us from the good that already exists. And we may have to do it a little at a time. 
we are, as every time we treat, we are setting into motion the law of mind to help us produce that change. But, but what we have to remember is, is that five minutes later, we can undo that. See, five minutes later, we can go back to our old thinking. And so I used to use, used to use a demonstration of, of have people stand in a room and then, and then take two steps forward and then take one step back. And then take two steps back and then take one step forward. So what that represents then is, is that we, we want to move forward, but sometimes we move a little bit forward, then we bring ourselves a little bit back, then we bring ourselves a little bit forward, then we go way back, see? And by deliberately and consciously doing our treatment on a regular basis until the demonstration is made, we keep making sure that we are moving forward. We are moving forward. Much of what is in what we call our subconscious mind is, has been in there for a long time, you know. And sometimes it takes a little bit of chipping away at it to, <clears throat> to break it down. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink of water here. <clears throat> so, key points. We live in a spiritual universe. The spiritual universe runs on consciousness. It is consciousness. It is consciousness taking form. Energy becomes matter. The matter is formed under the direction of consciousness. This is, this is what, in the beginning, God said, let it be, and there was. That's what we're kind, kind of trying to get across. What is true of the universe, the macrocosm, is true of us, the microcosm. This is why Troward titled it the creative process in the individual. The creative process exists. The creative process is the process by which the universe came into being. In us, it requires us to participate by being deliberate and declaring what it is that we shall have and then cooperating with the way that it works. <clears throat> the way to learn how to use it is to use it. Just like the way to learn how to drive a car is to drive a car. You use it. You have the, the guidance of your teachers, of, of the books that you read, of, of the things that you hear on, on the uh, audios. And you must apply them. And you must apply consistently. <laughs> Persistently. So Dr. Holmes tells us what we want to do is, is we want to look at everything as a condition except for the first cause, which is the let it be, the let it be. Everything else is a condition and all conditions are subject to change. So if we are looking at something that appears to be a big mess, for example, sickness, financial ruin, all of these things, whatever, whatever we might be looking at, those are conditions and conditions can be changed. So we don't want to get caught up in the condition and say, oh my goodness, this is a, this is a big problem. This is a big problem and, and it's gonna, it's, we're going to have to work a long, long time in order to turn this around. We're going to have to work a long, long time to turn our consciousness around. Cause is not impressed by the condition. The light is not impressed by how long the room has been dark. If we open the curtains, the instant we open the curtains, the sunlight floods in the room. There's no struggle Right? There's no, there's no moaning. There's no groaning. You know, <clears throat> if you if you open the curtains, the darkness disappears because the darkness had no power to keep itself in place. The darkness was a condition that only existed where the sunlight was blocked. We have to remember that. So we never want to look at a condition and give it, any, give it any power of any kind. We never want to look at a condition and say, oh my God, this is a tough one. What we want to do is recognize that it is a condition and that it only exists because there is some type of a temporary restriction or blockage 
in consciousness that is obstructing the flow of, of the divine energy, if you want to think of it that way, and what our practice of sitting down and doing our spiritual mind treatment on a daily basis, what we are doing is we are dissolving that obstruction. That's it. That's all, right? We are creating the avenue in consciousness through which the divine can flow. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing superstitious about it. It is done unto you according to your belief. And it is up to you to prove that to yourself. It is up to you to find a technique. It is up to you to find a way to do that. And when you do, you see, as you do, two things happen. Right? Life is wonderful. Life is a great adventure. Life is something to explore. Life, life is full of boundless opportunities to pursue. If, if obstacles arise, they are conditions to be dissolved into the nothingness from which they came. And as life is getting better and better and better, the, the great benefit is, is that I am consciously bringing myself to acknowledge the presence and the activity of the divine in this world through me and as me. I am growing spiritually. I am growing closer and closer to the presence of the divine with a conscious realization of the activity of the presence of the divine. This is what, what Dr. Holmes called the mystical experience, right? A conscious realization of the presence and the activity of the divine within me. <clears throat> That's what the mystics had. We are all mystics. The divine is within each and every one of us. So I'm going to give you a quick example. And then, and then next month, being February, next month we are going into love. We are going into what is love? And how is love a path? A path to experiencing the divine. So think of, think of something you would like <clears throat> to experience in your life. Whatever that might be. And then consider whether or not whatever this experience is, do we think that it already exists within the divine mind? What, whatever it is. is. Is it an experience, a greater experience of health? A greater experience of wealth? A greater experience of love? A, a greater order and harmony in your activities? You know, all of your affairs work out properly. Is it your spiritual practice? You know? Is it your self-expression? You know? Whatever that is, can, can we envision that it already exists in the divine? Right? The divine already is perfect health. The divine already has enough and plenty. The divine is constantly expressing itself perfectly. It knows all there is to know, so it, it is full of divine ideas. So if we can bring ourselves, this is step one, we bring ourselves to understanding that whatever this thing is that we are, we are deliberately choosing to work with today, the divine already is it, the divine already has it. Then the next step is to bring ourselves into the realization that that includes us. Because what is true of the macrocosm is true of the microcosm. The divine is all presence. The presence that we think is us is some part of the divine wearing the costume that looks like us. <coughs> Creating a unique personality that, that we recognize as us. If the divine already has it and the divine is expressing life as me, then the truth is at the center of my being, for, for lack of a better way of putting it, at the essence of who and what I am, then I already have it too. I can bring myself to that level of understanding, then I can say, well, then, I, then it must be true. I accept it, you see. I accept it. I declare it to be so. It is so. It is here. It is now. And anything unlike it leaves me. Anything that appears to be obstructing its demonstration leaves me. 
when we arrive at that point, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling of gratitude. It's already done. I'm not grateful because it's going to happen. It has happened. There's been a shift. There's been a shift in my consciousness. The unlimited good of the divine now flows to and through me. And then this is this last step. I want you to go back to the example of the garden. And this last step is we have to, we have to surrender it to the law. We have to let it go. You put the seeds in the ground, you cover them over with dirt, you sprinkle them with water, and you have to let them go. You have to trust that nature knows what to do. You don't go out there every day and dig up, dig up your seeds. <coughs> you don't wonder every day, are the seeds growing? You know that they're growing. So what we have to do is we have to bring ourselves to a realization that there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief, and it has now taken over the proposition and has done its work, and it is now unfolding. It is now unfolding. We don't want to take one step forward and two steps back. I release, I let it go. Tomorrow morning when you get up, if the demonstration has not yet been made, do it again. Do it again. Every day, every day, until the demonstration is made. Napoleon Hill, in his famous book, Think and Grow Rich, he gave us a story of a man who uh, wanted to be <clears throat> mine gold. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he got some investors together, and he bought up some equipment, and he staked a claim, and they started mining for gold. And they dug, and they dug, and they dug, <clears throat> and they didn't have any gold. And the man came, became discouraged, and he sold, sold the claim, sold all the equipment to another fellow for cents on the dollar. And the first thing that other fellow did was he called in a, a geologist. And the geologist kind of looked over everything, and he says, yeah, he says, there's gold down there. Just dig a little bit further. And the story, as Napoleon Hill t tells it, is, is that the new fellow dug just three feet further and found this massive vein of gold. <coughs> and of course, the moral of his story was persistence. Don't stop. Don't stop. What will you do this week in order to allow love to express through you more fully? What will you do this week to sing and to dance and to play with the divine? What will you do this week to help solve problems by allowing the creative answers to flow through you. What will you do this week to experience more fully the love and the presence of God in, as, and through you? We must use it. Our life is our practice. Every day we have opportunities to practice. Every day, <laughs> several times a day. Some of us more than others. We have the tools in our toolbox. We must use them. I encourage you <clears throat> to go forward this week and remind yourself as often as possible that you're not just a human being. You are a spiritual being in a human experience. And this week, you learn more and more how to call on that spiritual nature, which is cause, and be totally unaffected by condition. You are the very love of God in action, an adventure in the unexplored territory of mind. Let's have fun with this this year. Let's have fun just seeing how we can learn more and more and more about how magnificent divine love is in, as, and through us.